person. That's um, better. Oh, that's yeah. better. If get closer. Yeah, no. Okay, great. I think we can start. We have a quorum. Uh, may we have approval of the agenda? Make a motion to approve. Yes. Any objections? Second. Thank you. How about the minutes? Any corrections or changes um, that need to be made, or can we have an acceptance of the minutes as presented? I accept. I second. All right. Terrific. Uh, so there's a lot to talk about, needless to say. Thank you so much. Um, one of the good points that we can talk about is ridership continues to climb on all parts of the transit system. Uh, after school opened on that Friday, we hit 2.2 uh, or 2.7 million uh, riders. I'm trying to remember which one it was. Now, that's obviously shy of the 6.2 that we've had on our record pre-pandemic days, but it's the highest we've had up to now, and that's a great sign. Um, I continue to see lots of school children in the subways, um, uh, lots of additional people, obviously, whose offices have opened in the subways. Uh, buses appear to be crowded as well, and we hear that uh, both Metro North and the Long Island Railroad ridership is climbing. Um, it's nowhere near what we'd like it to be, obviously, but uh, it's it's better than the uh, McKinsey predictions, which were, I think, uh, purposely uh, not so great, so that if things improve prior to their to their uh, 2024 dates, uh, we would all be happy, and we we definitely are happier about that. In addition, we now have cameras installed in all 472 subway stations. And this is a wonderful thing. Now, they're not all high definition, but some are watched in real time and some record and hold what they've seen, you know, for up to 30 days if they have to be inspected, if, if a crime has been committed or somebody was seen uh, or, or relates uh, an assault or, or anything like that. But um, to have all, all stations covered now is really wonderful. That's something that uh, former President Sarah Feinberg was very much in favor of, and we support it, and we want riders to feel safe, obviously. That's an important piece of getting them back in the system. Um, and who knows what other crimes or terror-related things that these cameras may pick up. So I don't know how you can be opposed to the cameras. Um, they're not facial recognition, I don't believe, but they will still do the job. Um, in addition, there are, ever since Ida and the storm that preceded Henri, um, there have been resiliency updates made, nowhere near what we need to do. I was on the PATH system the other day, and there was a big sign that said, a little water won't hurt us, and now a lot of water won't hurt us because we've, we're putting in these storm doors, these actual doors to stop water. Um, what we are doing is things in the neighborhood of inflatable bladders. I don't believe any uh, storm doors, per se, have been uh, or a plan for construction yet. Uh, after Sandy, we, what we did do was we made the subway stations in Lower Manhattan a lot more resilient, sealing up sidewalk vents and other, because it's a low-lying area, Lower Manhattan, so um, especially around Battery Park. So they did a lot of work on South Ferry and Whitehall Street and Fulton Street and Wall Street. But we're nowhere near what we have to do, and that's why we are hoping that congestion pricing will become uh, the law or be put into effect. It's already the law in New York State, actually. And um, we will get the money we need for the MTA capital program, which is $51 billion. This will give us, with bonding capability, you know, 10 or $11 billion a year. And that's a lot towards making the system resilient, accessible, some expansion, um, and a lot of much, much needed work, tracks, signals, stations, all kinds of improvements. So uh, we're going to talk about congestion pricing. The hearings began today. Uh, oh, yeah. They're happening now. They're happening right now mm -hmm. as we're sitting here. Um, tonight is the hearing for the actual congestion zone, Manhattan south of 60th Street. On October 6th, it will be for the area adjacent to the congestion zone, Upper East and Upper West Side. And uh, I expect some people to say they are worried. Could, could we discuss it now? 
Um, not at this moment, but we certainly I've been can. trying to signal you, but will we discuss it sometime we will during be discussing this meeting? It. Yes, indeed. Plus, especially, I actually listened to what, until this started. I I was on with the uh, with the hearings, and some interesting stuff came out. And uh, as you know, my, many others don't. This has been my baby since it was first proposed by Sam Schwartz about ten years ago. So I would like to be able to say a few words about it. We are going to. When is the time is right. Report. Yep, we will have a chance shortly. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, um, we have a new head of subway car maintenance. You may have seen the uh, releases. Her name is Sue Ling Ko. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. She is the first female head of subway car maintenance and Asian, of course, and um, she's been in maintenance for quite a while. She seems to really know her stuff, so it's very exciting to, to welcome Sue Ling Ko to the head of subway car maintenance, and Demetrius has told me she's really good, so that bodes well for, for our maintenance. Uh, we may actually at some point be able to get her as a speaker, and she can speak about all the challenges that are facing, you know, the 10 different kinds of subway cars that we have. Maybe it's more than that now. I have to go through it, but I'm not going to bore you with that. So that's really exciting. Um, I went to the uh, unveiling, I guess it's two weeks ago now, of the new 42nd Street shuttle, mm -hmm. which was, it's like night and day from the old shuttle. I remember having to run around when they announced that the train would be leaving on track four. You would run around the curve uh, by the one, two, three lines, and you'd get there and the doors would close in your face. Well, now they've done away with track three, so it's just track one and four with a huge, high, wide island platform between the two, and it extends very far east. There's plenty of room for people. You can now walk all the way towards the 6th Avenue line. There is a free transfer until midnight between the B, D, F, and M, and the 1, 2, 3, 7, S, A, C, and E. So you really now have an amazing amount of, of, of transfer capabilities at Times Square. Um, and um, Nick Cave, famous Chicago artist, his artwork lines the passageway between 7th and 6th Avenues, or Broadway and 6th Avenues, and it's quite something to see. So if you have a chance to use the, the 42nd Street Shuttle, I suggest going there and doing that walk, because it's really, really beautiful. And you won't believe how much room there is. So that's, that's all good news. Um, you may have heard, it's all over the news today, and as I was traveling down here, I saw the police enforcing it uh, for the first time, I have to say. And, Sharon, I believe you've noticed it, as others have, that it was not being enforced. But mask enforcement is really taking place as of today. I saw police at various stations on my way down here looking in the cars, walking up and down the train, not holding the trains so that they're delayed, but just they had three police officers on the length of 72nd Street platform looking in every car to see if they were masked up. So hopefully that message will get out because... We want people to return and we want people to feel safe and we don't want someone who thinks they don't need to mask up, which is a great disservice to their friends and family, to be the, the, the rule. Our mask enforce, our mask usage has slipped since the height when it was in the 94 range. It is down to like 86 or 87 percent on the subways, slightly higher on uh, commuter rail and buses, but it has slipped on the subways and if you ride, you've seen that. And we don't want that. We want people to feel safe and be safe. Um, so hopefully this will, the message will get out. I do recall on the PATH system, there are signs posted everywhere you could be subject to a $50 fine. We have that, but it has not been enforced. And I think a few high publicized um, enforcements of this rule will go a long way. So wear your mask. Um, there is a customer survey circulating now um, from Sarah Meyer's team. Um, they have, this is not the first time, but this is an updated one, and if you all have a chance, you should go online on the MTA's website and fill out the customer survey. They want to hear from you what you think about the service, the stations, the cars, the fares, anything that's disturbing you or that you think should be praised. Please go and fill out the survey. Um, 
Um, they will be analyzing the results of the survey. After the last survey, they did make some changes when they got certain complaints about certain things, and I believe they, were, they are willing to do that again. Uh, Chair Lieber has spoken in favor of the results of these surveys having an effect on how CMTA moves forward. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to do that. And now on to Trudy's favorite topic, congestion pricing. The first of 13 hearings, 10 regular, three environmental justice started today. Trudy, what would you like to say about them? I know that Bradley has testified. Lisa will be testifying later tonight. We're going to be Am I mute? Yes. yes. Hello? We hear you. Andrew, why don't you give, since you were there, why don't you give a report? Because I was just watching it on, you know, on the Internet through the link. Uh, why don't you just give a quick report on what I, I don't know if everybody knows that there, this is the first of, what is it, 20-some-odd hearings that are going to be held? I, I just said that, Trudy. I just told them it's the first of 13, 10 regular, 3 environmental justice. Oh, I thought it was no. Is that all? That's all. And Somehow. They're trying, okay. they're trying I thought to get, it was... you know, 20, 28 counties are affected by this, 22 million people. We expect the folks from New Jersey, led by Josh Gottheimer, to be really adamantly opposed to this. Um, we expect some Brooklyn and Queens legislators even to be opposed to this. Um, David Weber spoke out in opposition today, and so we heard from some Staten Island electives today as well about their concerns about um, the Verizon toll um, credit. And, and but they were not adamant. I was I was pleasantly surprised. Adam. That they were not adamantly opposed and said if it has to be, they gave some suggestions. But that the this this morning was for the outer boroughs, right? For the four outer boroughs. Tonight is for Manhattan. Yeah. Am I correct? Tonight is the congestion zone itself. But, but October sixth yeah. is for the area north of the congestion zone. So the um they are that that's the that's the way that they parsed it out. But they're um. But the MPA is saying anybody can testify at any time. If you can't testify during at, at, during one of the times that they've signaled, and fairly, how many people did I sign up? Ninety-six. Ninety-six. Ninety-six this morning, a hundred and something this uh, this yeah. evening. So they're going over the allotted time. Um, obviously, uh, people are very passionate about this. They'd already received something like four hundred comments, written comments. You can write in, you can phone in, you can um, testify. Uh, it's not really testimony because it's not a hearing. You can speak yeah. at these sessions um, at any of them. Um, you can encourage your friends to sign up and to, you know, speak in support of them. There were uh, a lot today of people saying that they wanted motorcycle exemptions. Of course, the yeah. amount of uh, exemptions. Kind of well, it was a lot more than that. It wasn't just the motorcycles were very organized. But if, if and do you want me to just since, Lisa, I started on this long before <laughs> the MTA. That's why Andrew asked me to talk. I, if, you, if you want a little history of this, it goes back to the days of Sam Schwartz. And this was initially opposed by almost every elected official, everybody who lived in the outer borough. That's why I was so pleased this morning to hear so many people, not only elected officials, but people representing from community boards, from community groups, and especially environmental groups from the outer borough, all in favor. And that, Andrew, if you want to know, I was pleasantly surprised to hear that, because that has not been the case all along. And I think that by emphasizing the climate part of it and how what's going on now and how this is going to be so important in terms of a climate crisis issue, I think that they're definitely on the right track. The one thing that, the, that so many people brought up and that I would ask, and maybe you know, is why this cannot be, why it has to take a year and a half worth of hearings and reviews and everything, and then have all more discussions. We're talking about about three years from now before this can be implemented. So, Andrew, maybe you have some idea. I don't know if the board has discussed this, but it seems that after all this time, because this has been dangling out there for at least five years, 
that why it has to take another three years to have the hearings and the and the reviews and everything else. I don't I don't think it's three years. I'm hearing much less than that. I did hear It's a year and a half. No, it's a yeah. year and a half worth of whatever and yeah. then there's another review process after that. Once a decision is made there will then be time to for for people who object to to um and then there's the whole thing about who gets the uh dispensation exemption. or whatever okay. it's being called exemption. and whatever and that's got exemptions and then that has to be reviewed and knowing how these things work if it's a year and a half before even a the first line decision is made and i'm just wondering why it has to be so so long um and i'm showing you andrew i'm showing andrew a um slide that they that they put up at the board meeting that breaks down the uh, which I'll which if I could figure out how to put up here I would do that. We'll send it to everybody. We'll send it to everybody. Uh, basically, uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, I can't see. I'm not on Zoom, so I can't no, no, see it anyway. No, 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 I'm not going to disrupt everything because I think we've got it. No, but um, but we. So I'm asking Andrew in, in a very dis short because I know this has come up at other board meetings and it's come up with people talking to me, even electeds who I've, I've been in touch with, who want to know why it's taking so blankety-blank long if it's finally everybody has agreed to it and and the, we don't have Trump anymore it's blocking it or anything else. So I'm, I'm asking what... Plus, plus we, haven't, like we don't, don't have the question. Traffic Mobility Review Board appointed yet. They will then hear the, the, uh, the request for various exemptions. That... So the, the talk of the exemptions, I'm assuming, is going to take a while. The good news, I believe, is that we have a favorable administration in Washington who would like to see this I, That's what I'm saying. And I have spoken to people from Washington have been in touch with me asking the same question that I'm asking now. Because we have a favorable administration, because they're trying to get it through, because it involves a lot of money, and right now with all of the other infrastructure bills and the and the the well the the three trillion dollars and the one trillion dollars and everything else that I ask the question again, and if you don't know, maybe we could try to find out why it has to take so long when so much of this has been already done and been approved, even if it's not officially approved well i'm going to I'm going to be asking uh, when we have uh, the next board briefing and and whatever, I will be asking about uh, the timeline when the uh, Traffic Mobility Review Board will be selected. O only the mayor has selected his appointee as of this moment. And that will probably be gone by the wayside. Yes, I would imagine while he, when he's gone, that, uh, that appointment may be gone. So we will see. No, but I will Eric, Adams has said, Eric Adams has said publicly and privately that he wants this to move as quickly as possible. And the mayor is now saying, I mean, you know how I feel about the mayor, uh, but... Uh, that he is saying he appointed his person. Why can't the rest of this board be appointed, and why can't they get to work? He has said that Judy? again, both publicly and privately. Judy, um, Jenna yeah. was asked about this at the last board meeting. I mean, and his response was, "This is not going to take forever for the Bayonne Bridge uh, environmental assessment." I, I heard. I but heard that the last is, board um, meeting. But the other thing, you know, that the the timeline really shows that the. And what the, F what the MCA has been saying is that this is a timeline that was determined by FHWA, that this is not determined by the MCA. Lisa, with all due respect. It's kind of what they're saying, too. I'm not making this up. I know what but they're saying. Please. I have heard it also, and people from Washington even because it took so, because nothing happened for four years during the Trump administration, matter of fact, it was killed, that now why isn't there some consideration? I know the timelines. I know the legislation. I know it in my sleep, practically. So my question, and that's why I'm asking Andrew if you could bring it up at the next board meeting, and you can even say that it's come from me or I can you know, I don't want to speak or anything. If you can just say that. I think it, others, others would like to know, too, so I, I'll just bring it up. If you could, I would really appreciate that. Absolutely. Would anyone else Thank like you. to speak on this subject um, while we're on it, Bradley? The only thing, and I, I can't remember if this was like. You can uh, pull this down when you talk. It's a little. Yeah. One, I'm not sure if it was Jana who said this, but they said since the last um, review of this, 
there's a lot more infrastructure that, that's been put in place, since this, such as bike lanes and whatnot, so that they have to now go back and reconsider all of these things because they've been added since the last review. But I don't know. Yeah. Open but, streets yeah. and all of those sort of things. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, right. They have to do more, um, more, more modeling and more um, congestion yeah. review and then the public review. And, just like, and they have to look at the different. Now they're doing the modeling in earnest. So, it's a small town in New Jersey. Yeah. Right? Um, so it's obvious this is going to be good for the environment. Removing cars and making the transit system more accessible and more useful and larger has to be an environmental plus. That's not in question now. The question is, what does the final product look like? What is New Jersey going to be able to bargain because they have the Hudson River tolls to deal with? Yes, all of that. There's also possible talk of some unique little insertions like if you're a, a Brooklyn resident or coming through the Hugh Carey Battery Tunnel and your destination is the Holland Tunnel, as soon as you set your car wheels down on Lower Manhattan Streets, you'll get the congestion charge. But once you go into the Holland Tunnel, for instance, since you're not staying in and causing more congestion, you may get the credit for having done that and the charge could be reversed. There's all kinds of little exemptions like that or deals, but let's put it that way, that they are going to examine to make this more palatable to people. Of course, you know if you stay on the FDR Drive or the West Side Highway and don't enter the streets and just go into the tunnels or the bridges, you don't get charged. Everybody understands that. Chris? No, oh, yes, there sorry. are some people who don't even understand that. That's why if it could be at your next, look, if, you, if at the next board meeting you bring this up and with the exemptions and and climate and everything else, and so it is, goes on the record exactly what we're talking about and why the the time since this has been hanging around for so long. I expect we'll be told this is the Federal Highway Administration's timetable, but I will do it, Trudy. And that's also if you could, I, if you could, let's let's not waste any more time now. As yeah. long as I, uh, you agree uh, to do it, and I would A couple of other people would like it. to speak, Trudy, and then we will move yeah, on. I don't, I'm not going to say another word. Thank you, Chris. The one thing that, and you, you just, you just, you just said it, Andrew, um, about accessibility. Because as you know, it is linked because Jersey. The problem is right now is Jersey side with accessibility has an issue right now because there is a concern for a person who is traveling from Jersey to Manhattan or to the other boroughs. There has been let, less talk about it or less mixed communication going around because I remember when Edith was here, she. And they always left out the accessibility app for seniors and people. I mean, seniors and people with disabilities. So there is some areas, as you mentioned, more accessibility train stations, more accessibility buses. And I'm talking about not just MTA buses. I'm talking about buses that travel to Jersey to New York City too. That needs to be make sure that's up there because a lot of the groups are going to be discussing it. Those are exemptions, or exemptions for um, ADA accessibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. And let's not forget. People from New well, Jersey. if you listen also, to the hearings Trudy, today, Trudy. More just, I'm just saying disability group. Oh, Chris, I don't know if you heard the hearings today, but there were most. So you know that most disability groups are now in favor of yes. moving this along with their exempt, exemption. And let's let's not forget that people from New Jersey or west of New Jersey will benefit from an improved metropolitan area transportation system. Yes, they're not exempt from that. If they ride the subways and buses and commuter trains as well. Yeah, I'm Sharon. Sharon, go ahead. I just wonder if you said there are a bunch of comments coming in. Are they mostly positive, or is there any feeling about that? So, the, 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 what we heard at the board meeting was that there have been about 400 comments received that were largely positive. I'd say today it was mixed. It's, it's definitely mixed. There was a lot of people, especially like <clears throat> from Staten Island, who are opposed to it. Um, but I, a lot of the people that got on, they did mention, a lot of them did mention the environmental benefits, as we did as well. Kara has been preparing some great testimony for us, so we've definitely been including that. So a lot of people are really pointing out the environmental benefits. They're also pointing out that they don't want it to take the 16 months for the review, um, but that the people who are opposing it are usually, for the most part from today, we're from Staten Island mm -hmm. because of the charge that they will. Yeah. Um, I've been on yeah. Normally, in, in a proposition like, or a proposal like this, People who are opposed would largely be the ones that turn out, but this one has lots of people on the pro side, and I think you're going to hear 
all points of view at these hearings. And, a lot of and you don't have to be from a specific geographic area to speak at that particular hearing. Anybody can speak at any of them. Right. And and we've been organizing for months on that. Right. And a lot of people are really pointing out the money that would come in for transit, as we did in our testimony as well, and how that will actually benefit riders by clearing congestion on the road. Yeah. The capital right. program might actually get done. Right. So, yeah. that's mm -hmm. a book. Jason? Uh, yeah, I uh, saw the whole thing, and even in, when I was on my way over here, I saw several testimonies, and I could say for a fact, mm -hmm. most of the comments were positive. Mm -hmm. But like always, in every uh, single public hearing, you have people from Staten Island yes. speaking against uh, every single MCA proposal. It could be because of double polling. Uh, it could be because they will potentially use the, the Staten Island resident discount. And even I heard several concerns of motorcycling. There's no, there's yeah. absolutely no discussion of Staten Islanders losing the Staten Island resident discount. That's an MTA policy. Right, but that's, that's that came up a lot. But it yeah. came out a lot during during today's testimony. Yeah. And well, if you're a Staten Islander and you use the Bayonne, Gothels, or Outer Bridge crossing, you don't get a resident discount, you know. Well, we're talking about Andrew. If the person from Staten Island uses the Burr Channel, then, then the Barry Tunnel. Uh -huh. To enter to Manhattan. Uh -huh. right. And if you do that and continue up on the West Side Highway past 60th Street, there is no charge for you. But for, or, this is for that's not that's not who's complaining. Yeah. I, I, I would guess that the majority of Staten Islanders are not driving into Manhattan. They may be driving to Brooklyn, which is why there was so much talk about the Staten Island resident discount continuing and the board heard that and made sure that it did continue. But the, only the, thing, the majority of Staten Islanders who, who are complaining are the, are the ones who were driving into Manhattan. Yes, Lisa, you're right. That's right. Because right. Even early this morning, uh, one of my comrades from the Amazon Labor Union drove me home and we faced traffic entering the Barrow Tunnel and then we faced traffic on the ground. And then again on the big week because of construction at almost one o'clock in the morning. It's like it's getting ridiculous. Yeah, there's a lot of traffic out there. Um, anyone have anything else to say about uh, congestion pricing? Bert, go ahead, Bert. Andrew, maybe you could fill us in. Who is running each of the individual hearings? Who is being t listened to? Who's running will be in charge of putting together a, a decision after all these two two years or whatever it takes. Well, I, I, I heard some of this morning's hearing and the lady who was running it sounds a lot like the lady who runs a lot of the MTA uh, public testimony. Yes, yeah. um, Kate Cantino wants to answer Kate? this. Oh, Kate, okay. do you want to answer that? Because well, sure <clears throat> I, I can answer the first part of Bert's question about process. So uh, good ears, Andrew, that's Leah Flex, who's now a uh, senior director yeah, of B&T. Yeah. <laughs> um, you'll, you'll hear me next week and my colleague uh, Leah, uh, Lucille Songhai as well and our colleague Howie Levine, but the, the process is being managed by Bridges and Tunnels and the um, and Will Schwartz out of External Affairs. Um, I cannot answer your questions about, um, you know, post public meeting process though, Bert, just about what we're going through with these 13 meetings. I think the answer Thanks. to the second question is when the Traffic Mobility Review Board is appointed, they will make a lot of the decisions on exemptions, rates, days of week, price per axle for trucks, those sorts of things. And I think we don't have that group yet, so we're that all at a loss to know how these things are going to turn out. That, that will be, I'm sure politics will weigh in on that. Don't forget, there's a 16 minute, 16 month process comes um, right during an election cycle. Yes, um, indeed. So there will be a state. lot of consideration that's, that, that, that's worth the bear there as well. Um, but right now it's, it's a, we've, we've been told, and Kate, um, you may have been in that meeting, 
that every comment is in, is incorporated into the uh, NEPA report that goes to FHWA, so that whether you make a phone call, send a letter, testify, or, or speak at the hearing, or however you submit your 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 um, oh, thank you. the state testimony, it's incorporated into the final document. Yes, that, that aligns with my understanding, Lisa. We are trying to, you know, value, if people are taking the time to tell what they think, those comments are all being valued the same, as they should be. As they should be. Thank you. Yep, my pleasure. Andy, you have your hand up? Yeah, go ahead. I will just mention that um, this morning I was listening to the Mark Simone show on uh, WOR and they were bringing up the topic of congestion pricing. The um, newsman very long time over there, Joel Bartlett was discussing that the original charge would be $11.50 from below 60th Street in Midtown. And uh, Andrew, you're gonna like this name. They were bringing up um, Andy Byford. And Andy Byford was telling Mark Simone while he was still president at the time, there's always a slim chance we could lower the congestion pricing charge fee. So it shouldn't be out of the table, obviously. So, so, so what we heard today was that the range that they may look at is the $29 uh, uh, or $35. 35 $35. That doesn't say Hello, my hand has been raised on the phone. I will no, 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 recognize you. Hold on. The, um, the, okay, thank you. Uh, I can answer some of those questions. The range will depend in part on the number of exemptions. Uh, no. um, oh. The time of day, you know, variable, yeah. the variable time tolling. Is there, this is all part of the talk of what's going to go into the model oh. um, and the decision making. Go ahead, Trudy. Okay. First of all, I don't know who this WOR person is or, or his relationship with Andy Byford, but that's all ancient history. The dollar amount has not been settled because a lot of it has to do whether the money that is the, the one trillion dollar package and the, which they're voting on next week. We will have a much better idea out of Washington what the amount is going to be for not only for this but a lot of other stuff depending on whether that legislation where there are discussion going on even as we speak, which include people like Josh Gottheimer and accuse and and uh, uh, what's her name from Staten Island and the whole congressional delegation. Congressman Nicole Malyotakis. The whole mishpacha, as they say. But, but the other thing is, is that eventually this is, as Andrew, I think you said, is under the auspices of the FHWA. And eventually, it's going to come through to them. And the sooner that these people on the transit, whatever it's called, the review board, are fully appointed, and that could all change if there isn't a lot of action between now and November of uh, 2022. Because if, if the Republicans take over the House and or the Senate, then everything goes back to point zero, which is why a lot of people are trying to get something substantive done before November 2022. And Rudy, I'll just mention, um, uh, there was a point about Eric Adams. Not many people mentioned that Curtis Lewa is against congestion pricing. So very good, valid point on the uh, Republicans. Yeah, no, but I'm not talking about the Republicans in the city. I am talking about what goes on in Washington. Because oh, essentially, okay. this becomes a Washington thing. We know. One of the um, points of um, legislation that created congestion pricing that they're looking at as part of the, the toll rate is that it must raise a billion dollars a year for the MTA capital program. Yep. So that's what will go into. Or at least. At least, at least a billion okay. dollars. Look, I would be happy to discuss it with all of you offline because I could take we, this could take a lot of time and we have a lot of other things to do. But believe me, I know from whence I speak. Okay, thanks. Um, Andrew, can we move um, and on your report? I wanted to add something onto your report. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, because let me take this off. I hear myself already. 
Um, one thing, Andrew, I did attend the Times Square also because as an actor member, um, and because part of the 46th Street shuttle is now ADA accessible, but you must be at the first two car, the really the first car of the train, because that's where the hump, which is now I call that a ramp hump, goes up a little, and I can tell you, you can fly in onto the train now instead of doing the Edith move, the like the jump in the air rocket moment. But it is very good, and somebody I know put a question about that, uh, the new entrance at Grand Central. I did get a chance to go look at it as well. It is very nice. Well, yes, and it is signages around, but the only concern is... Part of the one Vanderbilt development. Yeah, yeah, I was waiting for you to say that. That's why it's better to, so I can speed up. Um, the only thing that... Uh, it is a concern also because you know that uh, walking towards 6th Avenue is not ADA accessible at this time. Right. No, and they but did, it will be. It will be, but we need to make it very clear that 42nd Street and 6th is not ADA accessible. And they have they're they're putting signage up to reflect that. I know, and I did and I did see the signage people, and they agreed with me because it's not like some people might know that, but some people who are not here today or who are there don't realize they're thinking, oh, I could take the B train now to Bryan Park slash Times Square, and they don't realize where's the elevator? Oh, there is no elevator, and it's not on the maps either, but it is being worked on on the technology right. end. Reinforce the notion that mm -hmm. that new underground passageway to 6th Avenue is only open till midnight. It is not an all-night connection. Yeah, and that's correct. And I didn't have to say that. It's actually a new map that, that notes that, too, mm -hmm. I might add. Yes, and it's being added to the um, part of technology. They are adding that into to the system as we speak. There is a little complication because they are working on the uh, some of the main website areas right now, putting the bus, tracking where your bus is. It's been going in and out. Mm -hmm. So they are working on that as well. So well, your bus does Exactly. Yeah. But then when we did find out something, they did add something new. When a train is delayed, right, they will take away the queue, but then there was one time on the app will say, this queue train approaching is not stopping on the phone set. And it happened on a Sunday during when the R train had that bicycle on the track going, Psh! but that's something that um, it was nice to see the shuttle. Oh, that the you Steinway can, Street bicycle thing? Oh, my God. Yeah. And the one thing i got to make it clear to people, you know that the R train makes a curve coming in. How can a driver see that? Are you going to tell me he has, uh, like, Superman eyes? He or she. He or she, he or she thank you, Lisa. I'm just <laughs> trying to speed up. An R or M. Well, the M doesn't run on the weekends, Andrew. No, it doesn't. But, but it you know, there. But, yes. But I'm just trying to speed up and try to speed Jason, it up. Jason, do you want to say something? But there is a concern yeah, that uh, that curve there. Something about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in that complex, and there's no signage. Which complex? The 42nd Street complex? Yeah, the 42nd Street Bryant Park. Okay. Telling passengers to, to go to the 42nd Street shallow passageway because I thought it at first that they were going to use the same passageway that is towards the seven. I was wrong. You are wrong. I walked that platform. Mm -hmm. the, the, the northernmost stairs on the BDFM platform do have signage to indicate the shuttle connection is there, but only at that end. I looked at the whole platform, and there's only signage at the northern end for some reason. I found that signage where you just said, Andrew, but not in the rest of that the correct. complex. That's really correct. Right. But they should have the, the connection open 24-7 in case of if someone wants to get from the whole Times Square slash Bullet 40 complex to 6th Avenue but without having the shuttle running, because there's some instances that you're going to have late night, the 7 not running between Manhattan and Queens. Uh -huh. actually we, will, we, will, <laughs> we will be inquiring when they plan to have it open 24-7. Uh, it may be that they're still doing work on the Times Square end of the shuttle, and they require some closures at that end, and so they want to encourage you to use the 7 
to connect if you're going east west, but I'll find out. Because I already see Andrew on the on the MTA's website that the shuttle's gonna run twenty four seven. Yes, it will. The and will. the shuttle is that the shuttle is gonna run twenty four seven. Yes, it will. going to be, there are two old business. One, um, due to the fact that it's, um, we are now going, forcing more mass, is, and I, maybe Kate, Kate can ask this question as well, are, is Mass Force still going to be going, helping out, giving out masks during this time, during now till maybe the, for the next few Why months? Why would it stop if we're doing more I don't know, because people are asking me this question. I, can't I said yes, but I just, wanted, I just wanted to be proved right. Yeah, mask like, is still being enforced till January. Uh, I need that from MT government. Not. Okay, can you hear the? Did you hear the question? I I heard the question. I do not have the answer. We can check in with Sarah Myers' group. I can't imagine they're they're stopping mask force when you're now doing even more enforcement about wearing masks. Yeah. To make, would make and uh, Kate, is there a way, Kate? Can you remind them also that? Um, when they do the Long Island Railroad ones, they need to make sure they. C I want and thank you also. Let Luke know thank you, because Long Island Railroad barely had any masks left from Penn, from not just Penn, but Atlantic didn't have any. Jamaica didn't have any. It took till Thursday to finally get them. But t I wanted to thank you and Luke for that because that if you're asking masks for us to do Long Island Railroad, we need to make sure that we have the washable or the regular map. They didn't barely have anything left. It was a really hard to do. Noted. Yeah, and uh, that's surprising. And, um, and, let me ask Bradley. Um, Brad, Bradley and, and Lisa and several of us have made uh, numerous pitches on freedom ticket phase two to mm -hmm. various representatives of elected officials and actual elected officials. Uh, do we have an update possible date and time for the uh, absolute launching of this, and um, we're, we're looking, it was in October, I believe. Yeah, we're looking at it October 5th or 6th. It's not a, there's nothing that's nailed down yet. Or but, but several elected officials have agreed to be at the podium, so to speak. Well, they've, they've, they've agreed that they would like to. Yeah, they would yeah. like to. They and would certainly put out a quote for the press release, mm -hmm. and I think it's gaining some traction with various uh, geographical yeah. segments of the city of New York and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. And we have um, a meeting um, set up with Amy Paul and another meeting with Leroy Comrie. We were meeting with our Adam staff. We've um, met with um, with uh, the Bronx Board President. And, and Acting Chair Jana Lieber has mentioned numerous times they are looking at new fare options. The PCAC has done a lot of work in this regard, and we will definitely be looking at that. But, but we, you know, particularly um, thank you, Marisol, for, uh, for making that happen. Yeah. Um, and uh, hello, Saul. Uh, and and uh, we're going to, you know, continue to, to put it out there. And we spoke with. Um, I mean, if there was, if it was a great idea when we came out with it, but now, with ridership a fraction of what it was, and people needing a good excuse to come back, this idea is so fabulous and makes so much sense, mm -hmm. and would get so many more people on the system and out of their cars. Uh, it's just a win-win for the MTA, for the for the environment, for the transit system. We're gonna I'll put something together to share with the board. Oh, excellent. Excellent. So, um, Stuart, Stuart. Stuart, please, go ahead, old business. Yes, so at, at prior meetings, uh, we heard that there were some staff shortages so that full service couldn't resume on some lines. Are you still hearing anything at the board level about 
staff's return to work and and any lines that are still impacted by by this? Not only am I hearing it, Stuart, but when I go on to various transit apps that give me status on the various lines and I see delays and I look at the detail of those delays, it says due to crew shortages, we're not running as much service as, as normal. So I know that it's continuing on the A, C, and S, but I don't know how many other lines. Uh, those are the lines I'm normally seeing it on, unfortunately. Um, we, we, okay. we, um, we had a briefing um, just the other day um, that uh, your friends with him. But that looks at that, that, that there has been um, a tremendous uh, push to increase the number of operators um, or, uh, to, to begin, um, sorry, I'm letting people in as I'm speaking, um, to bring in, um, to, to bring up the number of um, crews more expediently by yeah. reducing the amount of training, but also by encouraging um, some retirees to come back. Yeah. Not you, Jessica. Um, <laughs> to, <laughs> no, you can't have that second motion. And to look at a, at a whole host of different techniques that we've heard about at the board level, but also, yeah. you know, that are that are really being um, to focus on um, making sure that there's sufficient. Um, our speaker is, is ready, say, so yeah. we have like time for one or two more, and that's that we must move to our speaker. I was going to say, can I hold that's, my question? Thank you, Andrew. Because I want to add something. Jason, to that. can you hold yours till after? Oh, very quick. Why that? Yes, you can. Oh, very quickly. Yesterday, I was impressed of seeing every single police officer of Transit District 32 in my whole station, very mad. Uh, but great. I wonder why NYPD Transit wasn't involved in yesterday's press conference. Can't answer that. I don't know. Because I only saw MTAPD, not yeah, Transit. That's true. Uh, not NYPD PD. I don't know. That's who, that's who is in under the charge of the MTA. So let me let me give you a little background. Um, we're very pleased that Frank Taro, um, acting president of MTA Bus and senior VP of New York City Transit Bus, has joined us today. Uh, buses are increasingly important in the transit system. Um, they've always been important, but ridership returned on buses. Uh, post-pandemic, or hopefully we're talking post-pandemic now, but I guess some of us are still living the pandemic. Um, buses are once again resuming their important place. Uh, Frank is in charge of 18,000 employees and 7,000 bus vehicles uh, and paratransit vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, the bus system, uh, not that long ago we had a press conference at Fordham Plaza, and we announced some new bus initiatives that would be taking place. Mm -hmm. um, a trial of all door boarding to see how that works. Resumption of the bus redesign hearings, which um, were very important in uh, deciding how service was going to be. Um, more transit signal prioritization so buses can get through the bad traffic that we're all experiencing. Uh, which will make buses more predictable. Um, what else am I missing? Um, there was one other thing I meant to mention on. New bus purchases. Well, th th yeah, there's new bus purchases, but there was one. Oh, very more enforcement, much higher enforcement, and more cameras in bus only lanes so that people who are blocking bus lanes will realize there is a penalty involved. So there's a whole host of new bus initiatives, but let me let Frank. Introduce them, and Frank, thank you so much for joining us. Well, so I just want to say at the, at the outset that this, this, this meeting is being recorded, as, as they always are, as a public meeting, and it will be posted on our website. We have no press, members of the press, um, who are in attendance today. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate it. So, um, as Andrew mentioned, uh, uh, some of the initiatives he just went over, I'll, I'll touch on with this uh, presentation that we're going to give to you, provide for you, and it'll, it'll give you a little bit more insight in each of those areas. But um, 
you know, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really excited. My name's Frank Anacaro. I um, am acting president of MTA Bus Company and acting senior vice president of New York City Department of Buses, New York City Transit. Um, I have many years of experience in the transportation field with the last 18 years being right here in the Department of Buses. Um, I worked very closely, uh, most recently with Craig as he ran buses during the toughest time period in history. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm focused on continuing uh, the, the progress buses has made over the last several years. I'm fully engaged and I'm committed to delivering the highest levels of service that our customers deserve. Um, and of course, I'm very much looking forward to working the, with the PCAC as we move forward ahead and collaborating. So thank you. So I'll just, I'll, I'll take you through a, a few slides here. Um, next slide, please. So today I wanna to go through a few items that we just mentioned on the forefront of our bus operations. Uh, first, our preparations for fall, the ridership increase we anticipated and we've begun to experience as, as we welcome back New York. Um, the details of our joint improvement plan with DOT that Andrew just mentioned. And finally, uh, an update on our zero emissions fleet program. Next slide, please. So with so many uh, businesses returning to work in the, this fall and school reopening in person, we expected an increase in ridership. And this involved a big push on many fronts. Our, our biggest challenges have been operator availability uh, as the pandemic increased attrition and slowed our ability to hire. Uh, our service management team geared up uh, to be nimble and responsive to you know, any service adjustments required. Um, to catch up, we've been working on many fronts. Specifically, we expand our onboarding and training program, increasing our bus operator class sizes from 60 up to now uh, to 100. Uh, we're streamlining schedules to maximize bus operator availability. Uh, we've also uh, been making sure our fleet is ready. So, uh, you know, we have all the operators in the seats, we have buses. And we're working on getting more qualified candidates in the pipeline faster through with, uh, with our uh, human resources department. Next slide, please. And as anticipated, we've seen results in increased ridership. Uh, we're after staying around 50% of ridership, uh, of pre COVID level riderships, for about the past nine months, we saw about a gradual increase up to about 60% pre COVID and uh, over the late spring and summer. And, you know, that was, you know, as uh, vaccination rates increased and reopening began. But then over the past two weeks, we, we've, since schools and businesses reopened, we've seen uh, a jump of about 500,000 riders a day. So we're, we're back to about two thirds pre-COVID levels. So we're very excited. We're very happy to see things coming back. Um, our mission, both the MTA and DOTs, is to vastly improve customer experience and then to increase ridership on buses. This means uh, cutting commute times, sharing real-time information, and using every tool at our disposal to do so. Uh, we'll go into each of these areas uh, on the incoming slides. Um, but priority one is adding, uh, is adding and improving our existing network of bus lanes and busways it's clear that this is the most effective way to increase speeds. Uh, to point to just one of our, our many examples, uh, travel times on the M14 improved by 30, 36% on the 14th Street busway alone, and uh, it, it ridership increased up to 24%. And we need to make sure these busways and bus lanes are well enforced. Uh, the MTA is working with the city to install hundreds of cameras on board buses and at fixed locations on key corridors to reduce the amount of illegal park cars and bus lanes and trucks. Another key tool for increasing uh, bus speeds uh, is transit signal priority so that our buses spend less time at the red lights. Next slide, please. Um, additionally, we're looking to leverage Omni contactless fair payment system. Um, uh, we're gonna, um, on select routes, um, Every bus in our 5,800 bus fleet has Omni now, so we can leverage this, right? Uh, also, the time has also come to revive our borough by borough bus network redesign, starting with 
the Bronx is full. Uh, public outreach for the Bronx redesign will be done. In the meantime, we'll be improving bus schedules on at least 15 routes citywide. Uh, we're going to give riders more information than ever by adding on, on board digital screens so they can get real time updates. DOT is also working on prototypes for a new bus time pole. And as we make the upgrades, we're, we're not losing sight, the need to ex expand and improve accessibility to the bus system. So that every New Yorker take part of the city's revival. Um, the MTA will roll out new buses with wider doors and more flexible seating options that can accommodate diverse customer needs, whether they use a wheelchair, a walker, or need space for a stroller. And to complement these efforts, DOT is looking for ways to improve accessibility bus citywide. Uh, back to slide uh, six, please. I think I, we got ahead of it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, you know, new bus lanes and busways. Uh, continue and expand bus lanes and busways is a major aspect of the joint commitment. Uh, DOT is committed to add and improve up to 20 miles of bus lanes and including five new busway pilots. Uh, this will be a major continuation of our recent successes, which include some wins in 2021. Uh, the two new busways I've already opened in 21 uh, are Main Street in Flushing and 180 Street in Upper Manhattan serving many of the Bronx routes. Um, uh, construction has begun on the Jamaica Archer busway and is expected to begin soon on the Fifth Avenue in, in Midtown. Uh, with those two completed, that would make four new busways in 2021 a really big accomplishment. Uh, and there's also new bus lanes recently opened, including the one at the Battery Place that helps many express buses get uh, through the uh, U Carry Tunnel. Construction is also underway uh, on University Ave and Storage Ave, uh, Story Ave, and should start soon on Pelham Bay Park and Avenues A and D later this fall. Next slide, please. So, uh, bus lane uh, camera enforcement. Uh, we have a joint commitment includes a major expansion of this. Uh, MTA's portion is a, to expand uh, adding 300 buses equipped in 2022 and at least 600 more in 2023. And New York City DOT will uh, also add 15 new corridors in 2022 on top of the more than 150 existing locations equipped with cameras. So the MTA is, is uh, bus camera program currently it currently we cover seven routes on 123 buses so we're gonna you know significantly expand that next slide please uh, uh we have a joint commitment includes expanding the uh transit signal priority on uh, up to 750 additional intersections in 2022 uh this would take this would make 2022 the largest expansion year ever uh, we've had a big push in 2020 as part of the DOT's uh, Better Buses Restart and have worked to maintain a momentum with a big year in 21. Um, as you can see already, we, we've um, already activated almost 500 intersections this year and we still have a quarter to go. So we're, we're doing very well. Next slide, please. Uh, restarting the bus network redesign again is a major aspect of our bus priority initiatives. Um, and the Bronx is up first. We, we met with the Bronx Borough President, in fact, yesterday to share an updated Bronx final plan. The reception was positive and we intend to incorporate a lot of positive and, and constructive feedback from the Borough President and we received and, you know, with a goal of implementation next summer. Next slide, please. Um, accessibility is something we continue to make improvements in conjunction with DOT. As I mentioned, um, DOT has made, it, has, has made a commitment to making accessibility improvements on up to 25 bus stops in 2022. Uh, and it, in addition, we're continuing to roll out the new seating designs on our fleet. Uh, we're adding 800 more buses by the end of 2022 with these designs. Next slide, please. Uh, making progress on all door boarding will be a, uh, a big um, improvement on 2022. Uh, we have committed to launch all door boarding on 10 local routes, providing a benefit to the riders in advance of the full system wide implementation as currently expected in 2023. We're still selecting the locations based on technical and operational constraints, but we believe we could reach some 
high ridership routes where all door boarding can be very impactful. Uh, we also have a robust signage and marketing campaign for sure to encourage the use. Uh, additionally, you know, schedule improvements are another key area that uh, the MTA is committed to making improvements as part of this bus priority initiative. So this will involve a close review of schedule so that routes with recent bus lanes or our priority treatments can get you know, full benefit of, of uh, routes. And we expect at least 15 routes. Next slide, please. Uh, our bus priority initiative also includes a commitment to expand the real-time customer information. This means more screens on board buses uh, and additional thousand screens across 2021 and 2022, in fact, um, as well as new improved real-time uh, bus stop signs. DOT is in the midst uh, of an RFP for a new design sign, a bus stop pole that has real-time information. And in fact, these will be solar power, so they'll be cheaper to, to, uh, to maintain and install. Next slide, please. Um, so finally, Ted, I'll just, I'll give you an update on our zero emissions program. Uh, since we last spoke, we had a couple updates. In March, we mentioned that our pilot program for the 10 uh, buses is wrapping up. Since then, five of those buses, the new flyer, 40-foot local buses operating in Manhattan, ended and their three-year run, and they were returned to the vendor. Uh, and we're coming up to the end of the remaining five local buses, the Proterras, that are operating in Brooklyn and Queens. Another change since we spoke is that we increased our next purchase for our, our first owned 40-foot local buses. Uh, we increased it from 45 to 60. And this procurement is ongoing and we expect it to be awarded by the end of the year with buses arriving late 22, early 23. And, you know, part of this was, is a valuable partnership project we're, uh, with our charging, charging infrastructure with New York Power Authority. And we're really making good progress with this. Uh, we'll remain committed to the, the goal of zero emissions by 2040. We expect more zero emission purchases uh, over the next few years as we work towards bringing that 500 in that's included in our 2020 through 2024 capital program. And you know, we, we are also exploring um, hydrogen fuel cell technology as zero emission propulsion option. Um, and that's, that concludes my update. So, you know, I'll open up if anyone has any questions or you know, I could provide any comments. Too. I have a feeling there will be some questions. <laughs> um, well, I do have my team on in case there's, if there's any questions I don't have, you know, we could we can definitely see what my team can offer too. So I hope I can. All right, answer George, that. you want to kick it off? Yes, thank Frank. Thank you, Frank, for the presentation. It was a very comprehensive, but I wanted to get a little granular. So if you could pull up the slide that talked about ridership. Um, just had a few questions about that, and maybe you could share it with the um, committee. Sure, that should be slide four. Okay. So how were we measuring um, ridership when fares were not being collected? So uh, with our buses are equipped with APC, automatic passenger counters. Okay, and so we're still... Uh, we're using both methods now uh, for this data, or it's just one method? Uh, right now, we're, we're back to using the AFC data. Okay. Yes. So using the data then, do we see any, because I said I want to get a little granular, do we see any trends by borough or type of service, you know, whether this includes um, the express buses or whether we see any differences in any particular borough or interborough trips? So I can get back to you on the actual borough by borough information, but the these the trends we're seeing is the resurgent is is more towards the local buses right now. The express bus uh, hasn't quite returned yet. I think express bus riderships um, we're we're still running around uh, fifty percent below uh, fifty five to sixty percent below pre COVID. So okay. 
Okay, and this chart is like adding it together. Uh, yeah, th this is this is oh, this is total ridership. Yeah, right. So it would be so for local bus service, it would be even higher than. Yeah, yeah. Would one, one would say you know right. comparison, but we could you know we'll take a look at right. that. Sure. And the last question, uh, and then I'll give back the floor. There's, so um, are we seeing any issues in any particular borough with providing the required service? You know, you were talking about getting new staff on board, training. Uh, are, are, are we not providing full service in any particular borough or, so, any, or, or hub, you know what I mean? So overall, it's, um, so we, we do have um, some bus operator availability issues, as I mentioned, right? Um, but we're running approximately in the mid 90s, 95% service overall. Um, you know, and it's it's a moving target, right? Um, our our road operations, our bus track teams are engaged and they're watching the routes and, you know, they're making adjustments as needed, right? So, you know, certainly as we see issues on certain routes, whether it's, uh, you know, excessive spread or increased ridership, we're reacting to that. And we're seeing less and less of that because at, as we stated, we were able to increase our bus operator hiring. And every two weeks we have a class who actually, for lack of a better term, a, uh, graduates and is distributed to the, the most needed area. So, you know, this week I've seen, you know, more improvements than the, the previous week and, you know, and the uh, previous week. So, but, but you're not seeing any depot specific type issues. It, not depot specific. No, each borough has its, its issues. Right. And, um, you know, we move, we try to move the, 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 uh, you know, support, each depot with, right? So if there's, you know, certain big gaps in certain depots, we'll help support it with other depots. But, you know, certainly it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a moving target. Yeah, it's a moving Thank you. Target. Yeah. Rudy. Oh, hello? Yeah, we hear you. Yes, hello, we hear you. You can hear me. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that you got my signal. Hi, Frank, it's Trudy Mason. Hi, Trudy, nice to meet you. And it, and no, we've met before when oh. Craig and, and going going back to the days of Daryl. I think you were. I don't know if you were at any of the meetings, okay. but I, I'm going to bring up the same subjects, nitty gritty subjects that I've brought up at almost every meeting. The first, and I have to say that things are getting much, much, much better. So I really, you know, I what I bring up are not only things that uh, that I've dealt with, and you, I am an in in bus driver, I, I bus rider. It's it's much more convenient for me. And as you get old, as I get older, and the people around me, they use the buses. The first one is if the drivers could be instructed again about curbing the bus. It's getting a lot better. But there is still, especially for people with walkers or mothers with baby carriages or anything that has to go on, and that if they curb the bus, they will not have to keep on lowering the the um, what I call the plank, the um, kneeling the bus. Yeah. Kneeling the bus? No, not kneeling the bus. But when you put something that people can kneel on. Oh, the ramp. The, the ramp. The ramp. The ramp. Yeah. Uh, that uh, if if drivers could just be instructed, maybe putting out another general GO or something, or in their monthly updates about curbing the bus where it is at all possible. It's uh, there are some places where there's so much construction going on that they may. Not able to curb the bus and they may have to but where possible if, if, i i don't know if you're instructing them or if they're told to do it or what the situation is i know it's been that way before you know where they were notified and it got better for a while and whatever so that's num question number one are they told to curb the bus absolutely that's not only part of our initial onboarding training it's also part of our annual 19a training um, you know, we, we, we cover that extensively, but I hear you loud and clear and we're going to make sure we get that, you know, we, we echo that message, get, get it out there. Maybe there could be a little reminder. My second issue, which everybody is tired of hearing me talk about, is when there is a bus stop that is near a traffic light and the traffic light is red, 
even if the bus, you know, uh, and the, that the bus should not pull out into the street because there are people who are trying to get on the bus. Again, especially elderly, people with disabilities, people with big packages. And I know it, it makes a difference of about 15 seconds in, in service or anything like that. But in terms of people, I'm sure you've heard this, I'm sure you've heard it in complaints and everything else about waiting uh, waiting in the stop. When the stop is right, there's a light right at the corner of the stop, rather than immediately, as soon as it's boarded, pulling out and then they can't pick anybody up. Okay, I'll look, I'll look into that. I'll take, we'll, I'll take that back to my transportation and my training team for sure. Because they, um, the answer used to be, well, they, they lose time that way or something. But uh, the amount of time, 15 seconds or 30 seconds, I mean, that's the answer that, that has been given at, time, at times. But I don't think it really holds now. And, again, it's just people who can't, the older you get, the harder it is to run for the bus. I must say that there are some drivers who actually, if they see somebody trying to get to, huffing and puffing to try to get to the bus, they will hold the bus in the stop, you know, so that the person get it on. Again, I'm telling you that things have gotten a lot, a lot better. And then the third thing, which isn't really you guys, it's DOT, but again, can, you can talk to B, DOT, and I'm using 2nd Avenue uh, and the SBS on Second Avenue and First Avenue as as an example because I get it all the time, but I am told that this goes on in other places where there are SBS. Is that there is no logic to the placement of the bus stops, and that also, if there is an uh, 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 an SBS M15 and it is pulling into, I'll use. Two examples, because at 86th Street, between 86th and 87th in Manhattan, the regular M15 is further north, and the, the further south stop is for the M15 SBS. You then go one SBS stop further to 79th, uh, between 78th and 79th and 2nd, and you find that the M15 is now the further further south stop, and the and the regular uh, um, and the SBS is the further north stop, closer to 79th Street. It first of all just doesn't make any sense because people get confused and they're saying, "Wait a minute, I, it, this doesn't make sense." And of course, enough people know of my connection to the MTA going way, way, way back that I hear this from people all, all the time. And then if there is a why either bus can't pull into either stop, whether it's an, it's an SBS or an M15, rather than having the bus, if it comes, if it's behind, we'll use the, the 86th Street stop as an example, that if there is an SBS and it is behind an M15, that it will either wait until the M15 loads and then go around or go into another traffic lane to go around it to get to the other stop. It, it just, to me, it doesn't make sense, and to a lot of other people. Again, this is not just my complaint. I hear it all the time. Let's let him answer, Trudy. <laughs> what? Let's get an answer. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get we'll get an answer. I'm, I I know I have uh, operations planning online, but there's really you know, you know I could let them um, you know address it, but I think it, it warrants. We'll, we'll go back and we'll take. It a may look. have something to do with room for the placement of the uh, the SBS machines, but uh, it, it may be something else. So please take a look at that. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely take a look at it. And we'll, we'll follow up. And Andrew, did you have you brought up or have you discussed something that we discussed, which is and this is definitely not uh, MTA bus or New York City transit bus operations, but it's it's DOT. But you know those the the poles, the what do you call them, the ice cream, the ones that now give you the time when a bus is coming or everything, they are constantly malfunctioning. 
Yeah, yeah, they seem to malfunction on some routes more than on other routes. But, uh, Frank, you should also know that if one looks at bus time or, or those screens that Trudy was just referring to, there are some buses whose sending unit or whatever is not functioning, and a bus will come when it's not even scheduled to come. And whenever I, when Craig was, was head of buses, whenever I saw that, I would report that bus number and they would check it and it turns out the sending unit was malfunctioning. Mm. So, hi, uh, this is Sunil. So when you say the suspending unit, this is the digital screens on the bus? When I no, say no, I this is on the street at the bus stop. You know, they have them, uh, the, the ice cream pops, whatever the they call The real-time bus uh, things at the bus stops. Sometimes at the bus stop it will show it gives you a next bus. Next bus, you know, we'll use, again, I'm using east side right. buses, but a stop that will have a 101, a 102, and a 103, and it will give you the, supposedly yep. which time each is arriving. Either that's totally not functioning at all and it shows nothing, or it gives wrong information. Right. So, so with respect to the real-time information at the bus stops, uh, we have a nice uh, uh, process that we have at city dot who actually maintains those uh, signs so uh, you know you you keep sending us uh, that kind of information and uh, we would work with dot and and kind of have them fix it Believe but, me, uh, i have been sending it and i think andrew has you know andrew has been talking about this for, for quite some time so yeah, we'll i mean it, it's, it's not that it's what, what i'm saying is, is it's that it's an ongoing problem Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll keep doing that. Uh, Lisa? Thank you. Um, Frank, I, 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 I'm sure you've got a lot of um, notes, but I, I, um, the seven train um, system uh, signal issue the other day, um, you know, that basically shut down travel between parts of, well, between parts of Long Island City and Manhattan and mm -hmm. for hours at a time. Um, and I, I was wondering in those instances if it's possible, especially since there are a number of express buses that do run empty. If it's possible to uh, use some of those express buses, especially during morning rush or evening rush, if that's when it happens, as shuttles to bring riders either to the tunnel or to use them um, to take people to other train stations as the shuttles do when you know when there's no separate train service because you know, I did see like twenty to thirty dollar surge pricing on Uber. Do you want in place. It took me 40 minutes, 45 minutes to get from this Vernon Junction stop to Grand Central with by car. Um, so, but looking to see if there were any other alternatives, um, since there's just no other transit um, at that spot. So I just encourage um, looking at those alternatives. Yeah. So w we we did get your your suggestion and. Operations planning is looking at it. Um, first of all, I apologize that you. I'm, I'm sure that you have a lot going on. I yeah, I, I apologize, but yeah, we're definitely look at it, and whether it's you know the ability to, to, to divert you know express buses from their route to pick up, or you know uh, deploying you know a, a, a shuttle bus, right? But we're we're looking at it, and um, you know get back here, but certainly yeah, that's you know the the intent isn't certainly when the line goes down when the seven line goes down like you know other lines go down that you know we we need to be nimble enough to be able to provide alternate service to get folks riders in the system rather than going to uber or Lyft yeah or something. right and you know like i said lisa i apologize for that <laughs> thank you so much i'm happy Great. to yeah but, no but, but thank you for the feedback we, we did get your email and, and we're, we're looking at it for sure but thank you for providing thank that. you so yeah, thank you so much. Um, there are tons of bus lanes across the city, like those on Hillside Avenue. They're only in effect in peak hours, sometimes all, also only in the peak direction. They're often poorly signed. And most of the time they aren't functional since they're curbside lanes and they're used for double parking and for deliveries. Like, are there plans to try to not only push for like busways and bus lanes and new corridors, but try to improve existing lanes? Like Hillside Avenue is a major corridor, but the bus lanes are barely usable there. Well, I, th I think just, you know, th one part of it is just in fact, it, as the, the I, I think it's rather expedient expansion of, of the bus lane enforcement, that's going to help with that too, right? Getting that message out there that people are going to pay a fine if they, you know, if, if they continue it, right? 
and then yeah, continue with our, you know, also just our our local enforcement, our road operations enforcement is important, and you know, our partners with uh, NYPD is is definitely something that we can will continue. But I really think the 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 automatic bus lane enforcement program is going to really really amplify the message to folks that you know, like today you're hearing it's it's uh, mask up or pay up. It's going to be you know move or you know, I'll say what that Craig says, get out of our bus lanes and, you know, get out of our bus lanes or, or pay the fine is, is what, what it's going to be. So just one more thing. Like the thing is many of these lanes like Hillside Avenue heading towards Long Island, they're only in effect for three, like, for like, like it for like three hours in one direction and three hours in the other direction. Can you try to look into try to in making like bus, at least some of these like 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. or even 24 hours. Like, um, like you have many lanes that are, like if they're painted like 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 Nostrand Avenue, they're only in fact weekdays. They're painted red, but like drivers uh, uh, park there on weekends. But then they don't because there's parking there. And sometimes they don't see the red as meaning anything. So they see that as a license to park there on weekdays. Well, do we look? We'll we'll look into it. You know, it's a very it, it it's a very um, balance, right? Hard balance, right? Because. With the bus lanes, you know, the, a lot of the communities and the local businesses, you know, want to keep, um, you know, them open to cars and commerce off hours. So it's it's definitely a balance, but we we'll certainly, you know, look to expand as much as we can. But more importantly, I think it's getting the message out that, you know, when the lanes are in effect, those hours that people need to get out of them, people need to get out of them. So we'll, we'll uh, circle around on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. For great work. Jason? Hi, Frank. Jason Anthony here from Amazon Labor Union. Uh, we spoke uh, doing traffic committee, but you didn't follow up with me regarding uh, the bus service towards Amazon facility in Staten Island. So, so are you talking about the detours for the S S40 and the S40? Uh, now only that, Frank. Uh, as you know, uh, Amazon is the largest employer in Staten Island since 2018. So, you have over 75% of the workers coming from Manhattan, in other words, from the fair. And you have uh, workers coming from very early in the morning to overnight hours. So you have the S40, that's the local, and you have the S90, that's the limited, only operating peak direction only. Oftentimes running so packed that you have to stand standing room. So why not try and have the S90 limited operate in both directions during rush hour? instead of peak direction. And I've been noticing also since 2018 that some bus drivers, as soon as they get to the very last stop at the facility, they go out of service. And workers, when they come out of their shift, it could be either at 4.45 or 5.45, they have to wait 10 minutes or more for the next bus, and I can see two buses departing from Amazon to the ferry totally packed with workers. So what is New York City Transit is going to do about this issue? So you brought up two issues. At the committee meeting, we discussed about communicating with the folks about detours. We didn't discuss this issue, so there's two issues. And I asked my team to look at that about improving communications. Um, you had mentioned that the employees at Amazon did not subscribe to the messaging, right? So what our team uh, was it, is attempting to do is contact Amazon too, to make sure they can also message their employees on the details. Now, specific to, to this issue, um, this new issue here, what we're going to do about it is we're, we're, we're going to have our road operations and our operations planning people take a look at this issue, right? We'll do, we'll actually do ride-alongs and we'll see what the issues are. 
more specific to the the loads and improving or increasing the service if we you know if it it's warranted based on our observations but you know more but moreover you know if there's bus operators that are shortcutting or shortening the runs well that's that's simpler to deal with and that's swifter um but you know I'll engage road operations and operations planning. We'll take a look at the routes and see what makes sense. And if adjustments are needed, um, you know, when we can make them, we will make them. Okay. I would love to schedule a meeting with you guys and the executive team of Amazon Labor Union because I'm part of that executive team that we could uh, have a strategy that the MTA, in other words, New York City Transit, could have a better communication with these types of workers that come from the other four boroughs to work in Staten Island. We could, uh, our, G, our government community relations could, you know, potentially schedule something like that, I'm sure. Thank you, Frank. You're Thank welcome. You, Thank you. Um, this is, was before the pandemic. I was riding a bus in Brockaway and virtually every person who got on, every passenger, didn't pay. And I wonder what, can, you know, how can these new systems help monitor that? And you can't expect the drivers to fight with every passenger about paying, but what can be done to avoid that? So, so that's a great question, and, and that's, a, that's a, an ongoing paradigm. So, you know, APC helps us that. And that automatic passenger counters, they give us, we're, we're, what we can do at APC is we can compare basically ridership to AFC data, pay data. And we know, we look at it and we can tell where the higher fare evasion routes are. And then we could deploy, you know, our limited resources of our Eagle team and as such to go out there and, you know, help remediate these problems. And I agree with you, right. We can't expect it. It's not only on our bus operators, right? Um, you know, our bus operators are to remind people of the fare and proceed in service. The last thing I want to do is make it contentious for the bus operator or put them or any other passengers at risk. But certainly using the APC data and the AFC data comparison, we, we target and we do target those routes. Um, and fare evasion, you know, is an, is an ongoing issue. And, you know, we're always, you know, always out there looking at it and trying to improve on it for sure. Especially now, every every single dollar counts for the system. So. Yeah, Sharon is right. There are some routes where folks know exactly where the rear door is gonna line up and they wait there. And as soon as someone exits the bus, they rush on. And I'm sure you know the route. Uh, and we can take one more. Andy, go ahead. Okay, last question, sure. Hi, Frank. Um, congratulations on your new role at uh, New York City Buses. Um, I'm just going to be brief. I've been getting a lot of concern lately for the northwestern section of Queens, and particularly this affects a lot of other riders in northeast Queens who use the 266 bus route. Is there a reason why a lot of the stops have been eliminated lately? So... Yes, I'm going to see if I have somebody from my road operations or, or bus operating ops planning team who could answer this on, because I don't sure. want to butcher the explanation, so, but there is, Andy. Sarah? Yeah, I'm, hi, um, I'm from the operations planning team. We have been working with Department of Transportation on a project on Northern Boulevard. This is an overall complete streets project project aimed at making Northern Boulevard both safer and better for bus operations. One of the things um, about Northern Boulevard is the bus stops were very close together, sometimes as close as 450 feet. Um, as part of this project, um, and some of this was so that DOT could do capital improvements such as widening sidewalks and some of it was to make the bus go faster by consolidating some of the lesser used bus stops. We did discontinue a few bus stops. Um, this project is still ongoing and there's more capital work coming on Northern Boulevard. On balance, it should be an improvement for all of the street users of Northern Boulevard, including the bus riders. Does that answer your question? 
Well, let's see the uh, long-term effect because my concern has been a lot of senior citizens have been saying, well, now it's taking longer for me to walk to a different bus stop. So that is the cause of concern I would have as well. So everyone should still be within a couple blocks of a bus stop. And again, we're, we're not walking away. We're continuing to work in, on this project. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah. And, and I, I, you know, and in closing, I think a key, key uh, point to, to, to mention is that as Sarah is, is also working with our, our road operations team to in, improve communication about what's happening here. Cause this isn't the first time um, that we've heard, you know, people were surprised to see it. So we, we are improving communication, social media signage out there. So folks are aware of it because, you know, the worst thing to do is show up at a stop and it's not there anymore, right? So. Are you working with community boards on this Northern Boulevard redesign, Sarah? Uh, yes, we have been. We've had, um, over the past couple of years, we've had several meetings with the community boards uh, um, and they will be ongoing. Thank you. Thank you. So, oh, um, my hand, excuse me, my hand was up for like 10 minutes and you went Okay, we, we could take, we'll take one more. I have a hard stop at, at uh, quarter uh, two, so we got it. We have four minutes. Uh, sure, absolutely. First, first of all, Frank, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to be, I'll do it quick as I can. The main okay. question is, uh, regarding Brooklyn redesign, can you please let us know when you're going to start that up because there are, and I agree with a lot of people mentioning Queens and other boroughs like regarding bus stops and concern because, as you know, Brooklyn, other boroughs, we do have seniors and people with disabilities, so does Brooklyn. And there are concern of, you know, cars like to go on those bus lanes, as Craig and I agree on, but we need to work on that as well because there are a lot of bus lines that are very heavy ridership for seniors and people with disabilities. Because Andrew has been on one of those buses, and that's all I'm going to say from there on that. I am. I am. Okay, is that, are you, are you finished with your question or did you have- uh, That was my first one. Okay, you, you want to give me the second one and then I'll answer them both. But that's what I was just going to- my bad. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do also. Uh, the other thing is, is Craig has been also with concern of safety concerns in the part of South Brooklyn uh, regarding uh, passengers like to hit bus drivers. And it's been still going on on these uh, three, at least three of these bus runs. They are the B1, the B3, the 68, and the B36. And it's been going on a lot because of people, yes, not just regarding math, but don't want to pay the fare. And the driver's just sitting there saying, uh, you must wear your mask. He only says it once. But at the same time, there's no need for the passenger to bang or hit or anything. And there's been like, people don't understand where the white line is. The white line I know has been moved closer to the, where the folding seats for the wheelchairs are, but we do need to work on that as well for safety concern for the driver and everyone. Okay, so first, uh, the Brooklyn redesign, it is in the docket, but I can't give you a date. Okay, uh, right now, as we mentioned, we're working on the Bronx redesign. And you know, if I give you any dates, it would be premature. Right, because it, it really needs to, you know, we have started looking at it, as you know, but it, it's a very deliberate process and we need to do it right. So, um, you know, we're not going to rush any to get to any other borough, but certainly it's in the docket, it's in our sites. And, you know, when we could, when we have a, a valid date, we'll share that with you. Uh, regarding the assaults, yes, I agree with you. Well, number one, nobody has the right to assault any bus operator, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, and we are aware that we have some issues in Brooklyn. We have issues across the system. We're looking at those. We're coming up with strategies with our internal, um, our internal Eagle team with NYPD, and also it's about training. Also, um, you know, de-escalation. We're we're implementing uh, de-escalation training. We have it now, but we're we're actually enhancing it for our bus operators. Um, you know, we're, we're taking something from the NYPD's program that was very successful so that, you know, the, the best part of it, that one of the, we think one of the most effective parts of is avoiding it at all costs and de-escalation will help us that. But we're aware of it and, you know, bus operator protection, not only um, assaults, but overall bus operator protection is one of, 
one of my um, priorities for sure come, going into this. So um, I want to thank you all. Um, I'm just about out of time. Uh, thank, thank you, Frank. Thank you, Andrew and Lisa and everybody for, for you, allowing me to present to you all. And, and thanks for the partnership. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you all. Uh, we now can move to old business. Old business again. Yes, and then we'll quickly move to new business because we don't have that much time yet. There is? At two o'clock. We definitely sharp. don't have that yeah, much time. I'll, I'll be quick because I was answering to Lisa's thing about the shortness on trains. Um, the question, the thing is, is uh, they claimed one time there was shortness on the B train, but then when you look at the B train, there are like two B trains back to back. They're not even spreading them out there are times. For example, when they claim there's shortness on B trains, like, for example, if a B is coming at 140. When you say shortness, you referring to crew shortages? Yes, crew shortness, because okay. we already said that earlier. But the thing is, is that B, and there's another B five minutes, and I'm going like, then I'm looking on the other side, I'm like... You know that's something unusual. They weren't scheduled that way, correct? Yeah, for but, sure. but if there's a delay, that means that's like a regular delay. But that's not short of crudeness. But there is got to be done with the A lines when people are going to Far Rockaway. There's like two leopards, but nothing going to Far Rockaway. And there's been a lot of concern. Funny. One second, Jay. Uh, regarding the... Because people want to go to JFK Airport, I'm seeing increases more on the E and, and the J line because it's really getting to be people think, why I gotta wait so long for a, a Far Rockaway or a Rock Park A if it ever shows up. You have a lot of left for Boulevard A's. You need to like that yeah, well I I'm gonna to speak to Craig and mm -hmm. someone else, maybe Jano, but forty uh, minutes I think my idea of having all A's go to the Rockaways and the C extended to Lefferts makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons. It mm -hmm. would be a very tourist friendly uh, thing. Every every A train would go to JFK, Rockaway Park riders are now subject to, except in rush hours to shuttle service only. They're the only riders that are in that. Really place. good idea. Yeah, I think we need to push that idea. And for the record, the Q35 bus does get overcrowded yes. too. I know some folks in Leopards don't want an all local route, but they'd have to ride four stops to 96th Street to get an Express A. I don't think that's a terrible thing considering 96. the worth. 96th Street Rockaway Boulevard, yes. Yes. But there's a go to it with the program. <laughs> um, Andrew and Chris, with the problems on the sea line especially, it's no secret because every morning on New York One, I walk mornings on one, you know, stuff, and when they get to there talking about the subways, it looks like a couple of people use the sea or, or, or whatever, and all they say is the sea has crew shortages and they're not going to do anything about it. And they talk about crew shortages. I mean, so uh, I, otherwise I wouldn't know about it. But I know about it because they talk about it, and this is broadcast all over, you know, on cable, all over New York City, and now New York 1 is like all over the place. So I'm, this I'm whole issue of crew shortages is the common knowledge. I'm a C-train user, uh, along other lines, uh, near me, and um, the C-train is frequently listed as delays due to crew shortages. If you want to get really technical, the C does dupli other trains do duplicate the C's route. So if you were going, no, Andrew, all I'm saying is that they announced this whole problem with crew shortages oh, yeah. right over New right York on the, One. I mean, right it's on, not on just your thing. On you the know, app, it's on they, everything you check. A, C, I and understand, F. but this is this is broadcast. You know, it's not somebody using an app or yeah. anything else. I'm just saying it doesn't sound very nice. Yeah. We, we actually going to have to leave this room before too long, so let me just call on Bradley. Did you have your hand up? No. No, it was me. Jason, go ahead. Uh, relating to Chris said, mm -hmm. it is true. <laughs> the, you told the truth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know you're good. Because the 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 headways on the A's to the walkways is about twenty two minutes. Try forty sometimes. No, it is because it's every so other train. Days and I did this the other day. They had eight going to the walkaways every 22 minutes. Oh, 
sometimes of the day, that's normal they because you have the service. Yes, in the training. You have to, some others are going to leopards, of right. course. Yeah, two yeah. leopards, then a rockaway. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other items of new business before we? Oh, and also, Andrew, yeah. I've been seeing the R the R two eleven being tested in the system every single night. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Yeah, they were on the bright line. Um, Andrew, answer to your question about the, the station. Uh, it's even when it's on the Brighton line from Necro to H, but there is a concern um, where the train comes in with the hump, adding to the hump. There is an issue with some of the other stations, the way they have the hump that small. A May can handle the 8th Avenue when it's at uh, 14th Street, but in other areas, there is like a, a lift gap. Yeah, they, 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 yeah. yeah, I know you did, but I just did raise that, and they got back to me and said they've measured the R211 doorway width mm -hmm. with the R160s and the other A, uh, mm -hmm. the other B division trains that that those would be in use with, and apparently the humps still line up somewhere with those doors because the doors are wider. It just then the edge of the B division. Uh, Andy, you might be the last one. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so regarding the um, subways, because I know I've been hearing the conversation, I noticed on the um, 7 train, most cases, if you're waiting for a westbound train in Queens, the average wait time is now between three and five minutes, which is very good. And I'll just mention on the Queens Boulevard line, the average wait is now between five to eight minutes and i'm glad that we do have our frequent service back considering that the ridership is increasing and i would hope to see this uh, type of service continue in the near future it depends on the time of day that you're traveling because it can certainly be eight to ten minutes during the middle of the day lisa around 11 a.m to noonish yeah, and depending on the Queens Boulevard line depends yeah. if you're at Continental or west of Continental where you have the choice of EF, M, and R. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks to everybody. Um, stay well, and um, we will get so answers much. to any questions that were raised today. Thank, well, you. Right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye now. Sure.